Our scripture this morning is from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and it's on page 186 in your pew Bible if you would like to follow along. And it's imitating Christ's humility. <clears throat> if then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not require, re regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Holy words for God's people. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sandy. Three weeks ago, we started the sermon series on the Trinity. We began on Pentecost Sunday when I preached about the Holy Spirit or the Advocate and how the Holy Spirit intercedes and interacts in our lives in amazing ways. Last week, Pastor Meredith preached about God the Father. As she unpacked the story of Jacob at Bethel, she encouraged us to look for the activity of God in all of our surroundings. This morning, we discuss the third person of the Trinity, the Son, Jesus. I'm sure I don't need to mention that it would be impossible for me to completely summarize the life, the theological significance of Jesus in a single sermon. Check out pretty much any bookstore, religious or otherwise, and you would find an abundance of books about Jesus, ranging from the theological, historical, philosophical, and even moralistic points of view. A German philosopher once said that we cannot know things directly, but only insofar as, as we can perceive them or apprehend their impact. The identity of Jesus, he went on to say, is known through his impact upon us. In other words, the person of Christ becomes known through our work. Talking about the love of Jesus is one thing. Actually living and emulating his life is a completely different other. To narrow today's topic, I'm going to focus my reflections on three points. First is Jesus as Lord. Second is Jesus as optometrist. And third, Jesus as an empty glass. Before I go a step further, will you pray with me please? Holy and loving God, we want to fall more in love with you today. Each of us have come to church for many different reasons, and yet here we are in the sacred and holy ground. So God, as our physical bodies are here giving you a chance, Lord, we ask that you nourish our spiritual souls. And the words that I have prepared, God, in the time that I've spent trying to prepare this sermon, God, I ask that you can help me to step aside and may your spirit interact, intercede, and may your spirit rock our worlds today. So that as we talk and think and pray about what it means to worship you, Jesus, let this be less academic and theoretical and more about drawing us closer to you, the one and true sacred God. And as we do, God, open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to receive what you have to say to us. Let this time be your time, for you are truly God, and we are not, and we give you thanks for that. Amen. Let's begin with Jesus as Lord. In my ministry and in my life, my understanding of Jesus as Lord has evolved. I hope, always, that I'll be learning more about who Jesus is as I study and grow in faith. So I'd like to take you on a journey on how I have described Jesus over the course of my life thus far. 
Earlier in my faith journey, I understood Jesus as a gatekeeper. It's so easy to categorize Jesus as the one Lord of all creation, one that would facilitate my everlasting life in heaven. For me, at that point in my life, Jesus was no more than a historical character that I could find in any historical novel. Only this Jesus had a special set of tickets that I could get only if I was one of the few who can get into heaven. This Jesus, as I understood him, never really knew me. For all intents and purposes, this Jesus was exactly the same as Santa to me growing up, only deified. He knew when I was naughty and nice, and if I was nice enough, and if I had the right words, and knew exactly what to say to look right, maybe I could avoid hellfire and go to a peaceful, yet to me as a young person, boring heaven. There was nothing personal about Santa Jesus to me at this time. As I grew a little bit, not in stature or physically, but spiritually, (laughs) as a teenager and as a young adult, Jesus Christ was both my friend and my judge. He was always there for me, yet I found that he was also the great source of guilt. I found myself latching onto phrases that made me feel awful as a person. Jesus died for me. Jesus suffered because of my sin. Jesus took my place on the cross. These teachings, when taught in isolation from love and grace, they made me feel like what I was doing every day was I was worshiping a God whose sole purpose was to make me feel horrible. Now, I find myself most inclined to this phrase, Jesus Christ is Lord. God is described as Lord in both the Old and New Testament. The term Lord in Greek is Kyrios. In Aramaic, it's Mar. Alistair McGrath once wrote that the Tetragrammaton, which is those letters that we see sometimes, Y-H-W-H, represents Yahweh. It's found often in the Old Testament. In Judaism, it's considered improper to pronounce the name of God. That's how sacred God is. So the word Adonai is often used. Jewish historian Josephus recorded that the Jewish people refused to take part in emperor cult rules in calling the emperor of their time Lord. They believed that the term Lord was solely reserved for the one true God. Listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am God and there is no other. I have sworn a solemn pledge, a word has left my mouth, and it is reliable and won't fail. Surely every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, and they will say, righteous and strength come only from the Lord. These prophetic words sound a lot like the words we heard from Sandy this morning from the book of Philippians. In chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, it says, So that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven and on earth and under the earth might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God and Father. In both Isaiah and in the Philippians, it's clear and it's a direct relation and understanding that Jesus Christ is Lord. God's greatest expression for us is manifest in Jesus. It's manifest in the flesh that we know that we can have a relationship with God and this relationship is often available to us despite ourselves. When I consider this phrase, Jesus Christ is Lord, I find myself filled with hope. I find that this hope is the foundation of the belief that the gospel was never meant to exclude, but rather it was always meant to invite all who earnestly seek to know God in an intimate and personal way. This hope also informs us that through Jesus, we may know that we belong and that we are truly a sacred people It is through the relationship, it is through Jesus the Christ that we're able to have a relationship with God. It's through the teachings and life of Jesus that we are reconciled to God and to one another. Just as Deuteronomy 6 states, we are called to grow and love in our relationship with God. And in Romans 8, 18 through 38, it reveals to us that the lordship of Jesus Christ, that relationships are reconciled and are healed to God and all of humankind. And not only are we healed, but we're able to love God's creation and to love one another in the ways that God truly intends for us. You see, a mistake I think we make as churches is we get caught up. We get caught up preaching about Jesus in only one aspect. We might focus on the moralistic teachings of Jesus. And if we focus too much just on the morality of Jesus, Jesus becomes nothing more than a do-getter. Nothing more than a really good life coach for us. We might also focus on the Redeemer Jesus, or we might focus on the suffering servant. 
We might focus so much on the grace of Jesus, then Jesus becomes just this buddy who simply wants us to try our best each day. When the scales become unbalanced, when we lose sight of the complexity of Jesus' role in the Trinity, that's when things begin to get muddy. So often people say that the role of the Holy Spirit is mysterious and is complex, but I say to you this morning that the role of Jesus Christ is also mysterious and complex as well. I believe that we need to balance the breadth and the depth of what Jesus said and did. And some of the things he said and did, if we look really closely, they weren't very easy, were they? Matthew 10, 34, Do not suppose I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Jesus goes on to say, Anyone who loves his father, father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Wow! That's harsh. Just a few chapters earlier in the same account in Matthew, Jesus says this, If someone strikes you on the cheek, give them the other cheek also. If someone takes your cloak, give them your tunic as well. We cannot ignore these passages, but I believe that it's in the search for a balance between passages like these two I've just referenced to you. That's when we can begin to learn more about Jesus as Lord and learn more about the kingdom that God calls us to create here on earth. John Wesley once preached a sermon on perfection. He called us and challenged us to seek to be more like Christ in our everyday lives. It's through the process of sanctification and through the work of the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength and the knowledge to serve and to love as Christ did. Justification and sanctification, they're two doctrines that are dependent upon one another. Once we experience the incredible love of Jesus and are justified through Christ Jesus, we are then compelled to learn more and grow more and be more. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified in Christ and I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now in the flesh... I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when we experience a physical birth, when we experience a spiritual awakening, it's a way of saying that Jesus has touched our hearts in such a way that we are compelled to want to act and think differently. To be reborn in the love of Christ, we enter into this process that we call sanctifying grace. Theologian Albert Ritchell once wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, what he did was he brought something new to the human situation, something which reason hitherto rejected. Jesus was conscious of a new and previously unknown relation to God. Which brings us to our next point, one that I love, Jesus as our optometrist. Any optometrists in here, by the way? All right, last, last service I preached about it and the optometrist revealed herself to me, so... Don't worry, I won't make fun of optometrists this morning. So, we've all had our eyes checked before, haven't we? Y'all been to the optometrist, eye doctor before? So, if you're like me and you find yourself at one point in your life not able to see one of the lines that the optometrist tells you to, you might have to be fitted for corrective lenses. And this is a long promise of the optometrist sitting with you in a small, quiet room saying, is it number one or number two? Lens A or lens B? Well, well, we go through dozens of lenses trying to be as honest as we can, when in reality, sometimes they look exactly the same. (laughs) We do this because we know that this process exists because the optometrist cannot see what we can see. The first time I needed glasses was in the fifth grade. I remember distinctly what my life was like before and after getting glasses. Before I got glasses, school was challenging for me. The writing on the board and the posters on the wall, they seem just too far away. I figured that this was the case for everyone. At recess, I could not tell one kid apart from another. And they all seemed like their faces were just a little bit blurry. But before the fifth grade, I assumed that this was status quo. Until I put new glasses on and all of a sudden school became a different place. Outside at recess, I felt like I could see for miles. I remember standing on the playground, looking at a chain link fence, and realizing I could see the intricate details. 
I did not know that I lived in a world that was just a little bit blurry until I could see the sharpness and the contrast that my corrective lenses gave me. I would never have known what I was missing. According to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Jesus is absolutely everything. In his writing, Bonhoeffer describes Jesus as the mediator. He says, to really see one another, to really see the person standing next to you, the way that God intends us to, we must look at one another through the lens of Christ. If we look at people with the right corrective vision, and only the way that Jesus can provide, then we will notice and understand things that we never have before. Moments when it seems like it's hard to love the person next to us. Moments when it seems like it's hard to understand and communicate and hear the person next to us. When we have the lens of Jesus, everything comes into sharper focus. When we consider the grace and love of Jesus, when we consider that through the lens of what Jesus offers us, we begin to see people not as other, but as a creation that God truly loves, as a sacred and holy people. Lastly, I'd like to talk about Jesus as an empty jar. That's a Greek word that we found in the Philippians passage here. It's called kenosis, which means self-emptying. We don't have an English word for this. We can empty something else, but there's no word for the pouring out of oneself. But for me, this is a beautiful way to consider Christ's love, self-emptying love. In his book, Speaking Christian, where Christians' words have lost their meaning and power, Marcus Borg wrote this. He said, Christianity's goal is not to escape from this world. It loves this world and seeks to change it for the better. This morning during our communion time, I'll be introducing a new element to our sacrament. Before I bless the elements of bread and juice, I'll take a jar that is filled with juice and I'll pour it three times into one of our cups. This is a symbol of God in three persons. And as I empty the entire jug into the cup, you'll hear me say familiar words. This is the cup of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. The sacred liturgical moment is a reminder of God's awesome gift, the awesome gift God gives us in Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself and by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may this time of worship be sacred as we worship the Holy Trinity. May you feel the depth of the pneuma, the breath and spirit of God that is alive and active in our world today. In the moments of great joy, in our moments of great sadness, may you experience the presence of the Creator, God whose love is perfect as a mother and a father. And as you find moments in life when you seek to encounter the sacred one, May your life bear witness to Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. May you encounter Jesus the optometrist, who clarifies how we can see and interact with the people today. And may your life resemble the humble life of Jesus, one that was filled with a servant's heart to love, to give, to serve, and to pour all of yourself for all of creation. And as you do, may you be blessed. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? Holy, loving, and gracious God, We come before you this morning, and here we are, your people. We're about to be able to give our offering, our gifts. We're about to hear more about how we can engage in a relationship with you. We're about to take part in the communion elements, God. So Lord, may your spirit dance amongst us. May the paraclesis of your spirit, may the Holy Spirit dance within us, God, so that when we worship here this morning, as we continue this time, Lord, let us experience you, the Holy One, not a God that calls us to feel horrible, but a God that causes us to feel grace. And that grace can compel us in such a real, such a powerful, such an awesome way that we have no choice but to share your story of love and mercy and compassion to all that we interact with. For you are worthy, for you are God. Amen. Please join.